Commission of Tacoma Park. Mm -hmm. Is the microphone? Microphone. Okay. I thought this was. Let me use the handheld. I'll use the handheld. Uh, <laughs> I thought that was just for the Q and A. So sorry about that. Everybody. It's on. Okay. There so you go. the the uh, Arts and Humanities Commission of Tacoma Park sponsors uh, and coordinates this event and uh, a, a lot of lectures, uh, other lectures, films, poetry, uh, a dance, and music performances. We're, we're delighted to have a have a good audience here tonight. Um, and before I introduce our, our lecturer, I, I just want to take a moment to um, tell you a little bit more about what's what's coming up in the near future, both here and and around Tacoma Park. So. We, we have these flyers out front. You could uh, please take, take one, and, and you can also get on our email list. Uh, but we have several uh, documentaries coming up in, in April and, um, and, and a couple of poetry readings, and it, and it should be a, a, a fabulous program. Uh, around Tacoma Park, we also have events uh, which, which we, which we at, at the commission try to, try to support, such as the Art Hop, which is, is coming up uh, at the end of April, um, and there's uh, the Celebrate Tacoma event, which is, is May 15th. So, so take advantage of everything that we have to offer in Tacoma Park. Uh, with that in mind, I think that um, uh, the program tonight represents a, a lot of what makes We Are Tacoma and, and Tacoma Park uh, great. I mean, this, this presentation uh, tonight's uh, topical, it's, it's, it's thoughtful, um, it, it covers important uh, historical issues, but it's also contemporary. Um, it's being presented by a Tacoma Park uh, resident, uh, which, is, which is a wonderful thing, too. Um, so, so with all that as a, as a bit of a preamble, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about this program, and, and we'll get started. Uh, this lecture tonight is, is the first in a series of programs in April that are honoring the, the, the Reverend uh, Martin Luther King, Jr. on the 50th anniversary of his death. Um, we're hosting a documentary film screening in, in, this, in this room next Thursday, uh, 7.30. And it's about uh, the 1969 civil rights protest and armed standoff on the campus of AT&T University in Greensboro, North Carolina. Um, we have a monthly uh, poetry reading on the third Thursday of every month. And, and so this month, on April 19th, that, that poetry reading and, and our poet laureate, Mer Merrill Leffler, will have some poems related to civil rights and the legacy of Martin Luther King, Jr. Uh, Tonight, uh, we're, we're delighted to have the Pulitzer Prize winning journalist Clarence Page here, and he's going to present a lecture titled A Drum Major for Justice. Uh, Clarence is a nationally syndicated columnist and an editorial board member for the Chicago Tribune's Washington Bureau. He's a board member for the Committee to Protect Journalists and the Fund for Investigative Journalism. As I said, he's a longtime Tacoma Park resident and uh, says he was inspired to become a journalist by the civil rights movement in the 1960s. He's won more journalism awards than I could possibly mention, and it would take up most of his, his lecture time. Um, uh, but uh, anyway, we're delighted to have him, and we'll have some time at the end for, for a Q&A and discussion. So, Clarence, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this is a lovely crowd here tonight. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. It's good to see you. I am really uh, uh, very, very humbled by the invitation to uh, be your representative this year on the anniversary of Dr. King's assassination. I, I'm uh, a, uh, and I mean, any of you who've seen me on McLaughlin Group know that humility is not an emotion I'm normally associated with. <laughs> but, but this is uh, really quite a mammoth event. For one thing, I didn't think um, the uh, Keith Richard lifestyle I lived as a youth was going to allow me to live this long. <laughs> and. Uh, Number two, it is really, really quite daunting to think about the, uh, the um, uh, j just the, 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 the epic size and influence, majesty, and importance of the half century that uh, we've been living through. And it's, it's a time to stop and take stock of ourselves and where we are as a country and to ask that question that Dr. King asked so prophetically, where do we go from here? Uh, we're still asking the same question. And I think we ought to have, after 50 years, we ought to have some more insights than we had before. <laughs> but it all has to come out of, really, dialogue more than monologue. It has to come from e everybody. Uh, the landscape has changed tremendously since the 60s. And the 60s changed our national landscape and changed the world in so many ways. 
uh, changed our, the way we view politics, the way politics have acted and behaved. And uh, so I'd like to talk really about, since all of you have had the Black History Month uh, lectures about uh, uh, where, where Dr. King was uh, born, grew up, died, et cetera, I want to talk more about his influences, what influenced him and uh, what influences us, and the narratives of his life. That's what I do. I'm a journalist, and I, I'm, a, I'm a storyteller. And we view the world, we view history through the narratives that we know about. I mean, uh, what's the importance of stories? I always use the Sunday School example of the Ten Commandments. We all know, well, how many of you here can honestly uh, recite all Ten Commandments for us right now? <laughs> I don't see, yeah, I see a little few tentative hands. There's more than one version out there for one thing, but uh, yeah. I, I mean, I, I can't even name all seven dwarfs. <laughs> but I know the story of the seven dwarfs. And I know the story of the Ten Commandments, how the Ten Commandments were written, created. And that's why we really remember the lessons, the, the morals of those stories. That's all the Bible is, is just one story after another. In there. And that's really what we journalists do. We tell stories and we see the world through our eyes and then we turn around and report it through our eyes. There's a certain amount of distortion that's involved with that. Doesn't have to be fake news, not fake news. <laughs> but there's always a certain amount of distortion depending on what, what your point of view is. And you know, it, it's, it's uh, endlessly uh, ironic to me how much we sanitize history, how much we sanitize our, our memories, uh, how much we look at history in the way we want to see uh, what, what occurred as opposed to what necessarily did occur. Now, this means a lot to me because when, when I'm talking about, um, uh, well, I'm at that uh, stage of life that uh, Benjamin Disraeli referred to as my anecdotage. <laughs> well, all I do is tell stories all day long. <laughs> I hope somebody will be willing to listen all the way to the end. But this uh, last 50 years has been quite a story. I just came back from a 50th anniversary high school reunion, by the way, which is one of the sobering experiences of life, to say the least. But in any case, when I think about how I got in, into journalism, uh, you didn't hear the whole story there, actually. The, uh, the, the initial impetus was, uh, frankly, I didn't have much of a social life and wanted to meet girls. <laughs> and uh, there were quite a few of them on the newspaper staff. Uh, but that was the beginning, but Mrs. Kendall, Mrs. Mary Kendall, our, our newspaper advisor, was the one who really encouraged me because she uh, somehow saw some spark of talent. So if any of you uh, don't like what, what I've written, complain to her. She's uh, oh. actually still in my hometown now. I just talked to her. She's uh, 101 years old now. Ooh. Still sharp. So don't chew gum in her class. Ooh. In any case, back when I was in, uh, uh, this, this all occurred in my junior year of high school. Uh, that summer, uh, you had the uh, TV showing the fire hoses down in uh, Birmingham and, and uh, uh, shoot, firing away at people who just wanted to register to vote, fire hoses and police dogs. Uh, in August, Dr. King led this great march on the mall here in Washington. I watched it all from, from, from home on my black and white TV set. Then a month or two later, the, Four little girls were killed in the Birmingham uh, church bombing while they were putting on their choir robes for Sunday school. Uh, it shook up a lot of us, to say the least. Then the next month or so, JFK was assassinated in November down in Dallas. Once again, the media brought all this to me. And then about a month or so after that, these four long-haired fellows from England called the Beatles came on the Ed Sullivan Show right before they came here and played in the hockey arena over, over here by the Union Station, right? And I didn't know what was gonna happen next, but I knew things weren't gonna be the same, because so much was changing. At the time, when, when the Beatles won the cover of Time and Newsweek and Life and Look, and for you young people, those are magazines. <laughs> uh, something we used to receive our news in every week uh, on paper, uh, printed with ink. <laughs> and some terrific photography, very memorable and all, but, I went out to go find a copy of the magazine with the Beatles on a cover, couldn't get it. By noon, they were all sold out all over town. I knew this was, this was some kind of a new phenomenon. 
Today now we talk about media generated celebrity and all that, like it's routine, but back then this was something very new. So this is what was a time of great change that was occurring. We also saw people, in many ways, their lives were being changed by what was going on. I remember Sam Cooke, one of my favorite singers at the time, uh, heard a Bob Dylan sing Blowing in the Wind, and it made him sit down and write a song called A Change Gonna Come. Any of you ever heard that song, one of the great anthems of the black civil rights movement at the time? And many of us were going through changes. We were going through changes in the mid-60s as to what we called ourselves. I mean, I, I used to be colored back when I was young. And we, uh, there was no National, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. When I go down south with my parents, down to uh, the, the place we call the old country, but you call it Alabama, uh, <laughs> we go to, uh, I remember I was at a five and 10 cent store back when I was about seven years old. That was back when a nickel and a dime could buy something. And I was thirsty, I said, I'm gonna go find a water fountain. And before my parents could stop me, I went dashing off across the store. Mom told Dad, you, you, you better go find him. And Dad found me in front of these two water fountains, one marked white and one marked colored. And I was turning the one marked colored on and off, very disappointed to see the water was coming out clear. <laughs> no matter how hard I tried. I said, how come they got two water fountains here? And i never forget, he told me a word I'd never heard before, segregation. The first time I'd ever heard it. I was seven years old, and I never, I never forget it though, because it was the beginning of my education in, into a system that Southern life was centered on, and it wasn't just down South. We had segregation in the North too, as I uh, would later discover. Uh, we just didn't have the signs up North. But we were, we're, we're a divided society then, and we are a divided society now. But I remember when one day on my TV, I saw these black kids in Little Rock, Arkansas, who were being kept out of their high school by the Na Arkansas National Guard. And I said, what is going on? And how do I get the National Guard to keep me out of high school too? <laughs> Next day I turned on the TV and there was the 101st Airborne escorting these kids into the high school. And I said, what happened? And my dad said, Eisenhower. Said, Eisenhower? Said, yeah, President Eisenhower. I said, oh. President Eisenhower, I thought that was the job title. <laughs> so I said, who'll be the next President Eisenhower when this President Eisenhower is gone? <laughs> but one thing I remember about that was the first time I learned firsthand the power of politics, the power of leadership, the power of political change, the power of, of political action. Because here, these high school kids were challenging this century old system of Jim Crow that I'd been told, that you just don't make a fuss, you just go ahead and uh, 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 do, do what you're supposed to do and everything will be fine. Things were changing. That new generation was bringing about new change. And this was what was so important to me about the combination of TV and Dr. King and the movement. Some of you may have seen the uh, documentary the other night about uh, TV and the civil rights movement. Uh, uh, John Lewis uh, said something that Dr. King used to say that, uh, uh, that the, the movement without the media is like a bird without wings. You could still get things done, but it'd take a lot longer. And indeed, look at the impact, you know, we don't have any pictures of uh, Emmett Till and, and, and his murder, but when they found the body and they had the funeral, they had it, uh, uh, his, his mother insisted on an open coffin there in Chicago, and it, it was it ran in Jet Magazine. Another one of those paper things that we used to read every week. It was the internet of its day, you could say, because thousands of people came to Chicago and lined up on the streets to see Emmett Till's body. And, they, and uh, I believe they have a coffin now at the African American Museum. And it was a social and political phenomena that occurred that day that was partly media generated and accelerated because this narrative went out at a time when people thought we had gone beyond the old lynchings, but we could see that the lynchings were still with us. And it had that kind of a dramatic effect on everybody. And that was the beginning of an era, but we, don't, we still never, never saw that news happening as it was occurring 
But we did see Rosa Parks a year later when she was arrested uh, for violating the sit in the back of the bus rule. And when she was asked about uh, what gave her the strength uh, to do this, she mentioned Emmett Till, that she kept thinking about Emmett Till while she was in that bus. And uh, we, as we now know, she too was a much more, I mean, she, 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 most of us grew up learning this was a, a, a seamstress whose feet were tired. <laughs> Now, thanks to Oprah Winfrey, a number of other people were hearing more about her activism. Uh, she was, she, you, you, you could do a TV detective series out of this woman and her work down south uh, at, at risk to life and limb. But these stories are starting to come out now a little more. And that's what I feel like as, as a journalist, it's my responsibility to try to get out there and find the real stories, as the real stories, and present them as well as I can. And or, or to find out other people's stories, because we all have them. And now, we are at a time when TV news is so routine. All of us have um, enough technology in our pockets to, well, it, we got about as much technology in my smartphone as we had in the whole TV station where I used to work in the 80s, back in Chicago. And what impact does that have now? Well, for decades, we were hearing stories of police brutality. Going back and reading Dr. King's speeches, it's, it's poignant to see him talking about, especially near, near the end, which I'll talk about in a moment, but, but police brutality was emerging as an issue in the, in the mid-60s, and it is still with us. But nowadays, we also have cell phone cameras. We've got an extra witness in some of these episodes, and we're seeing, in some very tragic cases, people killed in cold blood and false witness trying to say that it was in uh, self-defense. But then we also are finding that um, there are people who, uh, uh, well, after the evidence comes out, it's still hard as hell to get a conviction. <laughs> so this is another phase. Is this justice? Or as Richard Pryor used to say, just us. And it makes one wonder. But I'm very optimistic nevertheless and it's just in my nature. I've seen so many changes for the better happen in my lifetime. Changes I wasn't expecting to see happen. <laughs> but it helped me every so often while I'm about ready to give up on humanity to restore some of my faith. But what's interesting though, I say all this as, as a preface for the fact that for all the tributes we see now, the marvelous statue out on the mall, the holiday that Ronald Reagan uh, signed into, into uh, being the many, many streets and boulevards named after Dr. King, almost all of them in poor black neighborhoods, but nevertheless, <laughs> it's, it's a start. In any case, amid all that, it's easy to forget how, how reviled Dr. King was in his last days. It's very easy to forget, because uh, we have, well, I, I was looking back, in fact, uh, Gallup poll had a little different way of measuring approvals back then, uh, but they, they uh, divided uh, approve versus uh, disapprove. Uh, Dr. King was so unpopular in 1966 that his rating in the Gallup poll was 36, sorry, 32 percent positive, 63 percent negative. That's worse than Donald Trump. <laughs> this is a point of comparison. But as Dr. King uh, and uh, as his children said, on a, uh, the HBO documentary I was watching the other, other night, that had he not been killed at the time that he was, the way he was, he probably wouldn't be nearly as respected and revered today. I can only imagine he might be about where Jesse Jackson is, uh, a, uh, a, a gossip column item or something of that nature. But this is the way public opinion can work. The narrative can shift, and the next thing you know, you have, uh, a, uh, you have a, a complete reversal of somebody's previous reputation. At the same time, I, I think, well, Tabitha Smiley's book back in uh, 2014, uh, 2014 the, the Death of a King, uh, he quoted several people who marched alongside King uh, while they recall his mood back in 1968. He was, not, he was not a happy man. He was a totally exhausted man. He just spent a decade 
of almost sleepless nights, uh, working constantly with the movement. Every time he turned around, there was something else going on. He was being reviled by a, a lot of people, black and white. He was uh, receiving uh, mounting death threats. Uh, we now know that some of those were partly generated with the aid of our wonderful FBI director, J. Edgar Hoover, working behind the scenes, who was thoroughly convinced that King and the SCLC were a communist plot. In any case, Dick Gregory uh, said to Tavis that uh, uh, King, uh, with tears in his eyes, said he, was, he knew he was certain to be killed. This was a, just a, a few months before his death. At the same time, though, uh, shortly before, uh, uh, shortly after that, uh, Andrew Young says that he noticed that uh, King had a certain tick uh, that he would exhibit when he spoke sometimes, and that suddenly one day this tick disappeared. D d he didn't see it anymore, and, and he asked uh, uh, King afterwards, "Doc, what happened to your tick?" And he said, "I don't have it anymore." I'm at peace with my own death. They, they knew the end was coming. I always uh, suspected he did, just judging by his, that last speech that he gave uh, uh, on the night before his assassination down in Memphis. You could just see it in his eyes and you could hear it in his voice that he knew that the end was coming. He had faced death threats since the 1950s, but they reached an, a new height there in 68. My own newspaper, it wasn't mine then, so I could speak freely. <laughs> also, all, all my bosses are dead now, so I can speak even more freely. <laughs> but, uh, I should say, by the way, uh, uh, Chicago Tribune, uh, wonderful newspaper, uh, founded in 1847 on two principles, free trade and abolition, both of which I still support. <laughs> and after, uh, they also sponsored this uh, tall, lanky, politician, Republican from Lincoln, from, uh, from Illinois named Abraham Lincoln, uh, who, who was, uh, was certainly my favorite president, at least until Obama came along. On some days, anyway. <laughs> anyway, Joe Medill, I remember our, our uh, editor uh, uh, sold Lincoln a subscription because we, we were the abolitionist paper in town and uh, Lincoln uh, liked the Tribune because of that and they became friends and a couple of years later. Uh, Medill asked him, hey Abe, have you thought about uh, running for president? We're starting this new party called the Republicans. And Lincoln said, well, to tell you the truth, I, I was thinking about running for vice president. And Medill said, Abe, nobody runs for vice president. <laughs> <laughs> A rule that I think is still true today. In any case, after that uh, great favor for black folks, the Tribune didn't hire the first black reporter until 1967. So, 120 years, but why rush? <laughs> I, I was hired a couple of years later uh, a, a, under what I call uh, an affirmative action program for journalists called Urban Riots. Uh, this was after uh, Watts, Chicago, uh, Washington, number, a number of other uh, cities uh, went up in flames there in the late 60s, and a lot of editors found that they were, shall we say, bereft of color in their newsrooms. And suddenly, in fact, the LA Times, famous case there, uh, a, a black uh, uh, worker in their classified ad department uh, was, was enlisted when the Watts riots broke out. <laughs> Somebody said, hey, can, can you write? <laughs> said, if I couldn't, would I be here? <laughs> and so said, we were wondering if you could go over to the Watts neighborhood and uh, take a few dimes with you and let us know what's going on. And they had their, they had their first black reporter. That was how we diversified newsrooms in those days. In any case, I, I bring all that up to say that the Chicago Tribune uh, was, at the time of King's death, uh, waged in a, something of an editorial warfare with him uh, over his support of uh, open housing and the Tribune's opposition to it. And, uh, in fact, the Tribune said, we think the time has arrived when the country must ask itself how much more it is going to pull it, put up with uh, from this incendiarist. Incendiarist. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. But uh, uh, has something to do with somebody who sets fires, I guess, uh, or, or makes incendiary comments. In any case, when uh, uh, the, the FBI took the threat seriously, uh, though its director and King had traded insults, when King attended a, a, a meeting of black pastors in Miami in February of 68, the FBI received a bomb threat, so armed guards were stationed outside King's room. Miami police insisted King stay out of sight during the five-day conference. In March, in Gross Point, 
where King addressed the Human Relations Council, of all places, uh, an affluent Detroit suburb. Uh, the um, uh, police chief to protect King sat on King's lap in the car carrying him to the high school where he spoke. <laughs> Neither was shot. In any case, and this was before his 67th speech at Riverside Church where he came out against the war in Vietnam, where even LBJ and a lot of other folks turned against him. But King did not shirk from what he saw as a moral imp imp imperative. If something was the right thing to do, then it had to be done. If something was the right thing to say, then it has to be said. And, and this was not a great way, way to make friends, one might say. But uh, King, who was who was in many ways lauded for the strides that had been made against Jim Crow in the South, uh, he was not lauded for bringing the protests to the North. Uh, particularly people like Mayor Daley in Chicago, among others, said, we don't have any racism around here. And there was, a, shall we say, a disagreement over that. In any case, the, uh, uh, it, 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 it reminds me of a story my father used to say about uh, a uh, preacher who was preaching the Ten Commandments one Sunday morning. And uh, he said, thou shalt not kill. And the deacon in the front row said, amen, reverend, amen. The, uh, the, uh, the preacher says, uh, thou shalt not steal. And uh, the deacon even louder says, hey, right on, reverend, preach on. And the reverend says, thou shalt not commit adultery. The deacon gets up and walks out. <laughs> but as, as he gets to the door, he turns and says, now you done stop preaching and going to meddling. <laughs> well, that was how the reaction was when Dr. King said, you got racism in your own neighborhood. You got right here in your own town. You got housing discrimination going on. You got people living in third world conditions. And it's just not right. Not a great way to make friends. But he did build a legacy on it, eventually. And he, uh, Oh, but even though at one point King told a reporter, I must confess that that dream I talked about that day, out there at that Washington March, has at many points turned, me, turned into a nightmare. I'm sure this is true. And you could see it in the strain on him and, and his family. Great sacrifices that he made, other members of the movement made. But we look back upon that period now and see how pivotal that little decade there between uh, 55 and 65. Look at all that happened in that time. Look how much the landscape, what, what we now call liberal and conservative politics was basically shaped during that decade. Uh, white Southerners loved the Democratic Party until black folks got some clout. And uh, <laughs> then uh, suddenly Barry Goldwater, when, what, what, what he carried, uh, what, was it, was it uh, six states, five in the South plus Arizona, uh, his own home state? And the South is the solid South was solidly Democratic before, it's become solidly Republican since. And the same thing holds to much of the uh, rest of the country as well. In any case, Dr. King preached a sermon called Unfulfilled Dreams. And it inspired, well, he talked uh, really about what same kind of thing he talked about in his 63 March on Washington uh, speech, his I Have a Dream speech that inspired the legislation that uh, ended Jim Crow, uh, King concluded that political equality was meaningless without a measure of economic <coughs> equality. And uh, this was on December of uh, 67. He announced he was gonna lead a new march on Washington in the spring of the following year, 68. Uh, that was the Poor People's March that um, many of us remember, which didn't occur until after he died. And it became emblematic of how much the movement itself had fragmented uh, and at the time of King's death, held, we weren't going to see another Moses like King very soon. In any case, the demonstrators there uh, said, we will go there, we'll demand to be heard, we will stay until America responds. Dr. King said, if it means jail, we accept it willingly for the millions of poor already are imprisoned by exploitation and discrimination. We're still dealing with these incarceration issues today and still dealing with the poverty issues today. But how much has changed? We also see that there was a, at the time of King's death, the, uh, the black poverty rate was somewhere around 60%. And that now, by the early 90s, uh, it had fallen to around 30%. It varies from year to year, 
but it's pretty much stayed at that level since then. And so there was a strong impact to the, a positive impact that President Johnson's war on poverty uh, brought about. But at the same time, ultimately, by the late 80s, we could see that the old black-white dichotomy that we had focused on so much in the 60s was now becoming more and more a have versus have not dichotomy. As Henry Louis Gates said in a uh, report he did back in 88, uh, the divide between black haves and haves not have nots is wider than the divide between blacks and whites, uh, statistically speaking. And there's a lot of truth to that because of uh, the, the, uh, not just the income gap, but the opportunity gap that we must deal with now. And this is a, uh, I think this is a lot of the reason why Dr. King, as much of a man of peace as he was, at a time when he was engaging in more and more debates with the rising black power movement, with the angry voices uh, of uh, Stokely Carmichael, H. Uh, Rat Brown, uh, and others, and uh, needless to say, a lot of noisy college kids like me uh, at that time. Uh, I had a lot more hair in those days, by the way. Just, just to give you an idea. Imagine a lot more hair, mud and chop sideburns, right? Uh, and, uh, our combat boots. Uh, and, and a propensity for greeting people like this. <laughs> so it was a different era. But in any case, it laid the groundwork for the same era we have today. I was uh, thinking about this as I was uh, speaking at the University of North Carolina the uh, year before last, uh, and uh, my speech, was, uh, my introduction was disrupted uh, by the local black student union uh, that uh, came in uh, and uh, announced they were going to. Uh, announced their, their list of demands that they had. Uh, I've been warned something like this might happen. And I kind of stood there with my old baby boomer geezer smile saying, well, they remind me of me. <laughs> but um, uh, then they, uh, after they finished reading their demands, they read off some demands from the University of Missouri students. I said, wait a minute, I'll, I'll listen to one college's demands at a time here. <laughs> and th then they pulled out a, a 1968 list of demands from their uh, UNC Black Student Union from 68. I remember because one of the demands was uh, to uh, uh, allocate $2,000 to, to pay Stokely Carmichael to come to campus to speak. And I thought there are a couple of problems that are going to run into implementing that now. Uh, one is he, uh, he changed his name to Kwame Ture. Uh, the other is he has now passed away. Uh, but in any case, the, the demands were read and once they were uh, finished, they, uh, students all marched out. I said, wait a minute, why don't you stay? We want to hear from you and uh, everybody else here. They said, oh, that's okay, we have a press conference outside. <laughs> I gotta compete with the media, right? <laughs> here you go. But I, um, I, I won't go into my travails of understanding uh, today's generation of college students, but I do see a lot that is familiar. And I also, uh, the most unfortunate thing that I see that's familiar is the issues that we still have the kind of issues I'm talking about, particularly poverty, uh, police brutality, income uh, gaps. Uh, we have debates going on in which, just as we're starting to get a consensus in Washington that we've wasted too much money on the incarceration explosion, we have an attorney general who says, I think incarceration is just fine. We, we need more of it, in fact. We have a, gotten a cons growing consensus of people who agree that drugs, drug addiction should be treated as a, uh, as a health problem, uh, not as a criminal problem. And we have an attorney general who says, I think treatment as a criminal problem is just fine. Well, build some more jails. Mm -hmm. So this is how history works. This is how the news works. Things swing one way and then they start swinging back. And so you, you have a constant effort must be made to try to, to get, get things right. So this is why it seems like we keep fighting the same old battles again. Uh, I would uh, say that uh, there are actually uh, new battles, uh, just uh, uh, or old problems in new uh, clothing, as it were. Today, we have people who are um, very much like King's critics in the old days, those who were either isolationists or who, were, uh, who felt we needed to take care of our own folks here at home and not worry about the rest of the world, or that those who disagreed were either traitors or commies, or um, 
Uh, now we have a whole lot of, of uh, new creative words that have come along. But nevertheless, change does come about if people push for it. If they don't, it's not going to happen. Today, I'm thinking about the, um, how Dr. King went to Memphis and he preached a sermon called Unfulfilled Dreams. And he, uh, he uh, referenced the Old Test Testament, arguing that King David hadn't seen his dream of the Jerusalem temple realized. He preached, life is a continuing story of shattered dreams. You are reminding not only Memphis, but this nation, that it is a crime for people to live in this nation and receive starvation wages. This was the beginning of his labor activism on behalf of the, of the garbage workers there in Memphis, a group that had been dis, disrespected and in some cases died on the job because of a lack of, of, of common decent safety measures. So when Dr. King said, what does it profit a man to be able to eat at an integrated lunch counter if he doesn't have enough money to buy a hamburger? <laughs> and indeed, that's simple logic. We see that the race issue is one thing, the class issue is everlasting, it never stops. Even after we've had a black president, we've had a black Supreme Court justices, we've had one barrier after another, racial and gender, that has fallen by the wayside. We still find, when you start talking about class, it's when people say, you know, you know stop preaching and going to meddling. But the fact is, it is persistent. And it also changes colors, it changes its, its clothing. A lot of us journalists were shocked as hell when Donald Trump won the election. It wasn't supposed to happen. All of our many crystal balls that we have, all of our demographic chartings that told us there was this firewall of half a dozen states, you have to win five out of those six. Oh, no way. And then boom, 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 boom. So it happened. I, for one, and I'm not alone, said, I need to get out more. By that, I mean outside the Beltway. <laughs> I went back to my hometown where I, where I was uh, born and raised, Middletown, Ohio. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Anybody here read Hillbilly Elegy by J.D. Vance? That's my hometown. That was, uh, I, I hadn't heard about Hillbilly Elegy yet, but so, somebody told me, oh, you want to understand Trump voters, read Hillbilly Elegy. And I found out, this is my bleeping high school. <laughs> but my bleeping high school, where I graduated in 1965, with our student newspaper, our yearbook, our, all, all this cool stuff we had back then, and as I applied to and was accepted into Ohio University, where I was charged the heaping tuition of $770, $1,240 with room and board. I could work at the steel mill in the summertime and uh, pay for that. In the winter, still have beer money left over. That was the American dream in the mid-1960s. We were an all-American city. That's the way we were moving. And, and they were going to have a big, massive $800 million, that was real money in those days, expansion in the 1970s. Well, the 1970s came along and uh, it turned out that the deindustrialization of America was, was in progress. Steel, aluminum, as my British friends say, number of other resources that we had that fed the Midwest began to disappear one by one. All five paper mills in my hometown closed one by one. National cash register was gone. Uh, Delco, Rem, uh, uh, what, Frigidaire, name one after another of, of the Ohio industries up and down I-75, and they're gone. And right behind them is where the Trump voters are. And I, my hometown, good, good old sweet Middletown, last year the 10% of the city budget went to uh, ambulance calls for overdose cases. 10%. We have, uh, now New York Times has us up there among the most heroin addicted places in the country. And, and now ketamine or whatever you call it, it's, it's coming along now. But whatever it was that killed Prince, that's all I remember. In any case, this is the tragedy. Now, so Hillbilly Elegy's gotten mixed reviews among my neighbors back there in Middletown. I say, well, the town's not that bad. <laughs> well, no, not everybody's house. Now, uh, I told JD when I, when I finally got, got to meet him, you know, I, I said, you know, 
I, thanks to you, I, I now know what life was like on the other side of town. <laughs> and, and a lot of, of, of the houses that the working class white folks going through the struggles that working class folks go through. And this is what I call the great tragedy of our modern politics. Dr. King, before he died, when they were organizing that Poor People's March, they emphasized this is going to have white folks, black folks, brown folks, the whole rainbow, et cetera. That was the liberal dream in the mid-1960s. Pull people together across class lines, unify them by, by needs, by, by a, a political agendas, and that would be the next great phase of the movement. We're still waiting to see that happen. Instead, we find that uh, things cut both ways. I uh, uh, went to Chicago, uh, where I got my real political journalism education, and uh, from from precinct captains. Uh, I mean, th 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 this is where you find out how politics really works. And I, I don't know if uh, Donald Trump did it by by uh, design uh, or by accident, but he certainly knows how to tap into rage on a massive level, and especially drop a few little catchwords like. Uh, uh, immigrant, rapists, blah, 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 blah. Uh, get people scared on top of their rage. And it's remarkable how much political mileage you can get out of that. I was, I feel naive that I hadn't expected this to happen, but I mean, I, I just been through eight years of Obama mania, for heaven's sake, when the world was perfect, right? Remember that? <laughs> Anything wasn't perfect, we're, we're on our, our way to fixing it, you know, no big deal. And that's when folks started getting apathetic uh, about uh, turning out to vote. I don't see much apathy this year, so we shall see. In any case, when I think about the legacy of Dr. King now, at this point, I can see how he would have a lot of reason to be frustrated, but he also have a lot of reason to feel some hope because of the messages he left us when we take the time to read them. Like I've, I've been hearing the, uh, uh, Judged by the color of, 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 uh, of their, what was it? Judged by the content of the character, not the color of their skin. So often uh, now, uh, from my conservative friends, that I have to say, have you read the rest of the speech? Because <laughs> you know you could take a lot of things out of context, and I'm sure that that helped a lot in getting a, a Ronald Reagan's approval for the holiday. But Dr. King uh, wasn't writing a feel feel good speech. Quite the opposite, he was setting forth an agenda for all of us to pick up on all of us, regardless of our walks of life. A new type of citizenship, a new type of involvement that people were just becoming aware of at the time. And this was why, uh, when I was thinking about what would be an appropriate message to give to you all tonight, I found myself going back to a, a speech that Dr. King wrote back in 67, uh, and he delivered this at the 11th Annual Southern Christian Leadership Conference convic Convention. And it was called, Where Do We Go From Here? And he said, near the end, I conclude by saying today that we have a task, and let us go out and do it with a divine dissatisfaction. Let us be dissatisfied until America will no longer have a high blood pressure of creeds and an anemia of deeds, I love that line. <laughs> Let us be dissatisfied amid the tragic walls that separate the outer city of wealth and comfort from the inner city of poverty and despair, shall be crushed by the battering rams of the forces of justice. Let us be dissatisfied until those who live on the outskirts of hope are brought into the metropolis of daily security. Let us be dissatisfied until slums are cast into the junk heaps of history and every family will live in a decent, sanitary home. Let us be dissatisfied until the dark yesterdays of segregated schools will be transformed into bright tomorrows of quality, integrated education. Let us be dissatisfied until integration is not seen as a problem, but as an opportunity to participate in the beauty of diversity. Let us be dissatisfied until men and women, however black they may be, will be judged on the basis of the, of the uh, of the content of their character and uh, not on the basis of the color of their skin. Let us be dissatisfied. Let us be dissatisfied until every state capital will be housed by a governor who will, be, who will do justly 
who will love mercy and who will walk humbly with his or her God. Let us be dissatisfied until from every city hall justice will roll down like waters and righteousness like a mighty stream. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when the lion and the lamb shall lie down together and everyone will sit under their own vine and fig tree and none shall be afraid. Let us be dissatisfied until that day when nobody will shout white power, when nobody will shout black power, but everybody will talk about God's power and human power. Martin Luther King, ladies and gentlemen. And I think of those words, I cannot help but also re recall another prophet uh, who said, the lion shall lie down with the lamb, but the lamb won't get much sleep. <laughs> My daddy told me that. <laughs> and it's still true that the lion shall lie down with the lamb, but the lion has to sleep uneasily, as does the lamb. We are not at peace yet. We have not reached the end of the road. And we should not be satisfied until we have. As Dr. King said, the, what, what the mind can conceive and the heart can believe, your body can believe. So keep your eyes on the prize. Hold on. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this being Tacoma Park, I can only presume one or two of you has, a, has an opinion about something. <laughs> and maybe a question or two. And this gentleman right here in the front, I, how can I ignore you? Go right, right ahead, have that mic there. One thing I don't remember in the past is the spate of white cops murdering unarmed blacks. Now it mm -hmm. seems to happen every month. Did, did cops become more racist? Or do we just all have more cell phones? Having worked in Chicago since the late 60s, I would say more racist, I don't think so. I mean, they, I mean, let's give them credit. They really hit a pinnacle of uh, magnificent racism uh, back at that time. Uh, and um, I think, though, the difference is in the video. Now, maybe I'm prejudiced because I'm, so, uh, I'm such a media junkie, but the power of video uh, cannot be minimized. The, uh, the fact is, certainly, there were many questionable uh, um, police uh, encounters over the decades, but it was your word against the cops. And uh, I, 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 it was simple. Well, um, we, when you look now, when you see like the, the, the man who, uh, who was shot uh, running away from a police officer down in, in North Carolina, remember uh, the, the police initially reported that he, uh, the man was shot in self-defense even though he was shot in the back. <laughs> Nevertheless, uh, uh, when, when the video showed up, which uh, a passerby had shot, it was very obvious that the, the man was murdered. But did anybody go to jail for murder? Not happening. And this has been the uh, other question, because, and, and I think part of this is we as a people, as a society, uh, and, and certainly the way the courts are set up, it's very hard to convict a, a, an officer. I mean, we, we do have a, a police, uh, former police captain in Chicago uh, named Burge, uh, who's uh, got so many victims on his allegation list. Uh, I mean, he, he, he was running a torture chamber on the southwest side out there. Uh, and it's like, uh, uh, it's such an extraordinary case that uh, it was pretty obvious he was, he was going to have, have to pay some kind of price. But, you know, the, I, I'm reminded of that uh, a scene in, in A Few Good Men when uh, uh, Jack Nicholson is, is the, the corrupt Marine sergeant but is he really corrupt or is he just a super marine? Because, you know, he says, look, there's the wall, there's you over there, and the only thing protecting you is me on that wall. You know, that's what it comes down to in a lot of people's minds. And that's, that's the way people view the police, that, that, that it's, you know, we, we, we gotta back them or we're not gonna have anything and the marauding hordes are going to come and take us over. That's what happens when you don't have a, a positive attitude in, in the community. Uh, the, the kind of thing that, uh, well, um, the um, cons consent decrees with the Department of Justice that, uh, that Jeff Sessions hates, but has helped us to reform police in Chicago, and it's helping to reform police in, in Baltimore right now. 
Uh, uh, they've uh, also, uh, they have actions going on in Ferguson, Missouri. Uh, there are positive ways to have law enforcement that is proactive, that works with communities, not in conflict with the communities. And more sophisticated uh, communities and uh, uh, lo local police and all understand this. Uh, but uh, unfortunately, the word is still getting around. Uh, I saw this the other day, uh, uh, Sarah Huckabee was asked in a, a news conference about uh, this uh, uh, obviously suspicious death out in uh, Sacramento. And she said, well, we view that as a local problem. <laughs> That's what George Wallace said back in the 60s. <laughs> well, it's a local problem. We don't need you outside agitators coming in here telling us how to live. Mm -hmm. So, you know, this is not, I, I, am, I am not anti-police. I've got police in the family. I used to cover the police. They, they got a tough job. And I, I'm speaking on behalf of the good cops I know. And because the good cops get pressured to just go along with the, with the rest of the gang as well. And we, we can do better than that. So I think, you know, uh, we're making those moves, but you can't just sleep and say, oh, well, we solved that problem. <laughs> but, but thank you for your question. You gotta be careful asking, asking a pundit a question. I, I'm, I'm gonna start thinking about my next column and say, hmm. <laughs> so a thousand words before you know it. You had somebody back there? Yes. Fish, thanks for coming. My name is Bedell. Yeah, hi. Uh, I want to take you off, off the road and talk a little bit. What do you think about the violence in the school? Do you agree with Mr. Trump, Mr. Trump, that it's your army teachers? <laughs> yeah, arming the teachers, yeah. I, uh, <laughs> thank God my phys ed teacher wasn't armed. <laughs> I would not be in front of y'all right now. But, uh, you know, it's a, uh, I'm, I'm an army veteran. I know how to handle firearms and all. But uh, you know, firearms aren't everybody's cup of tea. Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not opposed, though, to responsible teachers who uh, uh, have a, a, a gun out in their uh, glove compartment or something. I know one, one case, one shooter was stopped. And in fact, uh, at, at some high school I read about it. Maybe it was a middle school. Gotta watch those middle schools. Yeah. <laughs> we always talk about high school. Middle school, boy, that's the, oh, we need more attention, no question about it. But I think uh, the, the thing about Donald Trump that's just so delightful about him when he's not president uh, <laughs> is he oversimplifies everything. <laughs> you know, he's the guy at the end of the bar there, eh, they're talking about these school violence. Oh, just, just give, these, give these teachers a gun. That'll take care of them. Boy. Oh, yeah, I, I can see it. OK Corral down in hallway 3C. <laughs> there we go. But, uh, you know, there's a certain amount of frustration. I don't mind if somebody is, is just uh, innocently ignorant about something like this, because we got a serious problem with school violence that, that we need to do something about. But when you just have the knee-jerk response, especially one that's designed to get votes from your base, I, I don't have any respect for that at all. Uh, but uh, it, it is a political reality, and it's a reality out there for us journalists as we still uh, try, try to deal with it and have a really honest debate. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, I find it very, um, it, it's kind of poignant and, and inspiring to see uh, the, these uh, young people, though, uh, getting out from under their uh, uh, iPod headphones and uh, actually engaging in some political action. And uh, I mean, I, I was a you know, high school debate team dweeb, and we used to talk about socialized medicine up one side and down the other. These kids are talking about a real crisis going on around them in their lives. And they're actually having an impact because they're reminding people that we've got kids in these schools. And, and they've got, a, I think, they've got a, a right to live their lives like everybody else. So, so it's a, uh, I'm glad to see things are moving along. I don't expect much progress in this administration, but you know, this, I, I put, I put the, the, the gun issue in the same place I put uh, uh, medical marijuana and gay marriage. Uh, all of them are issues that 10 years ago I supported them, and I said, I'm not going to live long enough to see them happen. <laughs> but then what happened? You know? One day, all of a sudden, you look up, and suddenly the polls that were 60-40 are now 40-60. And I mean, when, when I was in college, I remember there was a, a Time Magazine had a national poll that found uh, uh, people who admitted to using marijuana, 25 million people. That was a big shock at 68. <laughs> Those kids are all grandparents now. <laughs> look out. I don't know. This is how I, this is how I get respect over at MSNBC with my deadhead sticker on my iPad, <laughs> my iPhone. Hey, I interviewed Jerry Garcia in 1967, so there. <laughs> anyway, yes, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, one of the things I th that I found interesting um, is 
in my view, Martin Luther King, you know, was kind of always ahead of the curve, and he had his conscience that would take him to the unpopular um, positions. Right. Um, and as you said, you know, it left him more and more unpopular. Uh, when thinking about kind of the world today, we do have a very multicultural community. It's not just the black and white kind of uh, divide in the United States. It's, a, it's kind of different, and I think the young people have a growing up, at least in this area, a very different group of people and, and cohorts than um, you know, it may have been. And I'm kind of wondering you know, where that might have taken uh, people's thoughts. And you know, as you said, you've got the young people, I think, speaking up on their own. I, and I would think that he would be championing that and, uh, and maybe still unpopular for that. Absolutely. It, it would be very easy to see Dr. King champion. <laughs> I mean, we don't, we don't even need to. Look at, look at the irony. We're talking about a man who was killed by a, 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 a assault rifle, if you will, if you, if, if you want to call it that. Uh, the issue, in fact, uh, gun control is going to be a hot issue after JFK's assassination in 63 and the whole issue of mail order rifles. And uh, uh, the um, um, Black Panthers had a role to play uh, in this out in California uh, when. Uh, the, uh, what the state passed a gun control measure, G Governor Reagan signed, uh, because they wanted to get rifles out of the hands of the Black Panthers. And the Black Panthers marched into the State General Assembly. If I haven't got the chronology mixed up there, but in any case, uh, the, the uh, first big gun control <laughs> measure, you could say, uh, was passed in, in order to uh, uh, take guns away from black men. Uh, so, but uh, a, a lot of folks remember this now. Uh, as, as the uh, debate has proceeded over the years. Uh, and the NRA has been rather um, slow to respond to cases where uh, black men have been uh, 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 accused of, uh, of, uh, of being, uh, of, of being uh, what, illegally armed or whatever. Uh, but this is uh, something that um, is another one of those issues that we actually were doing better on I mean, that issue, you, you could say, as far as reforms go, back in the 90s when the uh, assault weapons ban was passed. Uh, but nothing else happened. And at the time, the, the uh, NRA uh, supported it. Uh, they turned completely against it and everything else uh, just about uh, 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 since then. But now the pressure is rising at uh, such a feverish pace, even under a Republican administration, that we're starting to see some, some, some movement. Uh, so it's, uh, these things are always in a state of flux, but I'm sure Dr. King w would have been uh, right out there with these issues. Uh, I think about, though, uh, I, I have other what if questions. Uh, Black Lives Matter, for example. Uh, I, look, I, never, I never liked the name of the group, but I have yet to have a group that comes to me for approval before they, they name themselves. Because uh, I, I felt like, you know, it can, the, 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 the name can be misinterpreted <laughs> or can be easily distorted, which it immediately was by Sean Handy and a lot of other people, that, as if they meant only Black Lives Matter. And, and that was never the intent, and anybody with common sense knows that. But if you want to demonize somebody, uh, they kind of made it easy uh, there with that name. And uh, uh, at the same time, you know, you could say the Black Panthers made it easy with their name. <laughs> and now, by the way, did you know uh, uh, Marvel Comics Black Panther started in the early 60s? And when the Black Panther organization borrowed the symbol, uh, they changed the comic to, uh, what it? any Marvel fans here? Where's my son when I need him? You know, <laughs> it was, it, I, I, I want to say zebra, but it wasn't zebra. Maybe it was uh, uh, something, uh, something like that anyway. They only more recently changed it back to Black Panther now <laughs> because, the, because the Black Panther organization isn't around anymore. But it's a, uh, all of the, but it, it intrigues me though, though Stan Lee and pop culture and political culture were so intertwined in those days that it wasn't even that, that extraordinary that, that you had a, uh, a, 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 what, a powerful political symbol that emerged out of the comic book world. Uh, and it's a, uh, uh, nowadays we're seeing the same sort of thing happen with uh, uh, Black Lives Matter. Uh, they're having an impact. And I uh, say, you know, keep it up because they have put the issue out there on the front page. And that's the first step toward having a real dialogue. Uh, but I'm sure Dr. King would have been right out there too. He had a heck of a time with, uh, dealing with the black power movement. One of the speeches that he wrote specifically aimed at trying to resolve 
the dichotomy between the two. And it's, it's a brilliant speech, but one, one that hardly anybody ever talks about. But it's indicative how there in 67, uh, the black community was trying to find new ways to, to, to reunify uh, politically. And that is uh, really continued to be the case today. I think, uh, if anything, typifies the civil rights movement today and the um, uh, b black community empowerment movements uh, and various other uh, ethnically based identity movements. Uh, it is how localized they are, uh, how localized race has become. Uh, because let's face it, we are not just one country, we are a whole bunch of countries here. <laughs> Uh, the, the racial dynamics of Miami are different than those of Boston. Uh, there are, uh, the racial dynamics of, of the Dakotas are different. Oh, I had a wonderful time in, in, in the Dakotas. I, I, I raised the black population of South Dakota by 25% just by <laughs> stepping over the, 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 the border. And, uh, but it, it was remarkable. I, I had, a, had a great time. Uh, every time I've been to, to the Dakotas, but some of the conversations I hear uh, are intriguing about like um, how uh, oh, those Navajo, they just can't get it together over there, you know? And they're always drinking, not taking care of their families, having kids out of wedlock, blah, blah, blah. Sound familiar? <laughs> and then, when I go and say something and say, say, well, I'm not prejudiced now. I mean, the Sioux, now they got their acts together, you know? But then I go down to, to Nevada, and it's just the opposite. They say, <laughs> oh, 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 the Navajo got their acts together, it's the Sioux, they don't, don't know what they're doing. So, you know, prejudices can, can work that way. Uh, when you've got different groups, uh, they, they can tribalize and retribalize. But part of our confusion today over, over uh, our racial dynamics is that they're, they're so different from one part of the country to the next, uh, and that uh, they're mostly argued on the local level. But that's the way we are as people, though. We, we, we tend to be more locally oriented. Uh, but a lot of these problems are not just local problems, though. They need to have a, a national platform as well. Uh, yes, sir. Oh, let's see. Which way are we pointing here? Oh, there you go. Okay. Yes. There you go. We got to have Thank that microphone. Then we, then we know you got the power. That's what um, John McLaughlin said. You got that microphone, you, use it. <laughs> you've alluded several times to the different factions that existed among the black community when in, in 67 and, and around that time. Mm -hmm. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, a lot of it was generational, for one thing. I mean, my uh, parents and grandparents couldn't understand why we wanted to call ourselves black. Those have been fighting words for so long. Uh, then they couldn't understand why we wanted to wear our hair so long. <laughs> that uh, This is before Afro Sheen really took off. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there were so many, I mean, here, the, the main thing I heard more than anything else was, you know, uh, uh, we work so hard to send you kids off of school to give you a chance and you're not taking advantage of it. They said, well, you know, there's a revolution going on. You know, uh, we, got, we, we, we got a big fight happening. There was a draft going on. Yes, there was, <laughs> and, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so that was uh, one factional split, but there was also um, the movements it, it itself split factionally. Uh, there was, uh, I think about uh, uh, Ocean Hill Brownsville, uh, a uh, what started out as a school teachers union dispute uh, in New York that ripped these fissures open between the black and Jewish communities there in, in, in Manhattan and, and became a major issue uh, of, of debate and discussion nationally because blacks and Jews, I can't find two ethnic groups that have worked together so well and sacrificed so much uh, for so long as blacks and Jews have in the civil rights movement and other movements before and after. Uh, but Episodes like that, uh, this, this is before the Louis Farrakhan controversies came along later, but uh, they were emerging at the time. That was an important fact, so split between blacks and Jews in, uh, on, on the left uh, in general. Some of it popped up in the Democratic Party as well. Uh, then you've got, uh, I, 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 I've got to throw out the, the rise of, of, the, of the second wave feminism uh, as well, uh, uh, which, which divided uh, white folks and divided black folks too in a different kind of way and still does, although the conversations are getting a lot more sophisticated now because we've been at this for so long uh, now. But e even so, uh, we hear a lot of discussions nowadays about uh, does this Me Too have enough black input? Uh, I heard black students at that uh, high school in Parkland, Florida complaining that the white kids are getting most of the TV exposure aren't speaking for them. You know, 
Uh, these seem like little things, but they <laughs> little things mean a lot when you're trying to pull a movement together, and you've got issues that don't play out the same way in different communities. Uh, so when, the, when, when all of this first emerged, uh, there, was a, a, there were a lot of broken hearts uh, and uh, a lot of hard discussions, but I think we're all learning more about each other as time goes on. And, and uh, the Democratic Party itself today is split between um, should we go with identity politics or with uh, economic class-based politics? And I say, hey, you're Democrats, you do it all, you know? I mean, what, what did Will Rogers say? I belong to no organized party, I'm a Democrat. <laughs> he knew, that's what Democrats do. I mean, what, what, what Bill Clinton said that, uh, that uh, uh, Republicans fall in line, Democrats fall in love, which can work for you or against you, depending <laughs> on who you're falling in love with. But it's the nature of politics. But it, it's like, uh, I, I think uh, we can certainly see, <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of ironic right now. I'm, I mean, uh, everybody talks about how divided Republicans are. Uh, Democrats are extremely divided, uh, but they're unified by one thing, Donald Trump. Uh, just like uh, 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 Democrats, or rather Republicans, were united uh, by one thing in the last election, which is Hillary Clinton. Sometimes politics does that, that uh, just uh, picking your rivals <laughs> can be as important as picking your allies. Will that hold up over time? I don't know. Um, with, uh, I, I gave up predictions after the last election. I might as well be honest about that. Uh, but I think that uh, when, when you look around, though, at getting back to black community divisions that we were talking about, uh, this is an ongoing matter of discussion. Uh, I have noted that while we started out talking about class divides in the black community and opportunity divides, uh, some who have had more opportunity and taken advantage of it than others have, uh, we also now uh, find, well, we have ethnic divides in, in the black community. Not deep, but statistically, though. Um, you look, at, everybody talks about the, uh, what, uh, uh, a Asians as a model minority uh, because their academic achievement rates are so high. Uh, African and Caribbean black kids are coming up the same kind of numbers with first and second generation immigrants. Uh, you notice how it's become a sport now for some of these kids to get accepted to as many Ivy League schools as they can. I, I just saw somebody on the evening news the other day. And uh, the, uh, almost all the ones I run across have been either uh, uh, from Im immigrant families or children of immigrants. Because uh, they're, they're taking advantage of the opportunities here. It's a difference of attitude. And this is something that we have a lot of discussions about in, in the black community. And uh, uh, I, I had one friend of mine say, well, he's an immigrant. He's supposed to think like that. Like what? <laughs> like this is a land of opportunity, not just a land of oppression? You know, can't America be both? We are multitudes, <laughs> right? But this is, uh, I, you know, we're starting to see the discussion go that way, I mean, practical discussions, what really works as far as economic development, education development. Uh, but uh, it, it's so much easier to, to latch on to the emotional issues, and uh, th they can be terrific distractions, but they also can sell a lot of newspapers, and we're desperate. <laughs> Am I being too honest now? <laughs> yes? Clarence, thank, thank you for your uh, wisdom and insights, and w I'm interested uh, when Dr. King uh, spoke at the Riverside Church. Mm -hmm. He mentioned, of course, racism, um, materialism, which you've talked about in terms of, of, of poverty and inequality. But the third piece of the tripod was militarism, and you never yeah. talked about it. It got submerged, silenced, and the question was, why did not the press pick this up um, at over that time? time? At that time and, and today, mm -hmm. um, all we have to do is tune into a station and the, and the generals, the former generals are sitting there at the table, mm -hmm. but they're not challenging militarism. In fact, we're, we're at the pinnacle of our time in terms of the most, most military expenditures abroad, $5 mm -hmm. trillion dollars for wars that could have certainly benefited us here at home, mm -hmm. and we're not questioning the impacts of militarization um, when it comes to selling of military uh, arms back to our communities that are actually used in our communities, right? Uh, which was the debate with the Obama administration. Mm -hmm. uh, and we're not questioning the, the long-term cost uh, of that military machine to us as, as a nation. And uh, it's, it's surprising right. that 
I know you've been in the editorial boardroom, and we don't see it happening even on the editorial page to question those. I've been in the things. army too. I got drafted, so that's yeah. <laughs> that certainly has colored my opinion on this whole topic as well. Uh, yeah, uh, for one thing, um, at the time, this was a big story. Uh, remember, LBJ had just passed the biggest landmark legislation uh, for, for black folks since the, what, 13th Amendment? I mean, <laughs> you gotta go back to Lincoln. You know, the Civil Rights Act of 64, the Voting Rights Act of 65, the Fair Housing Act of 67, was it? 67 and 68 are blurring together now, but the, I hear that's understandable for, for the stuff that happened in the last century. But nevertheless, these were uh, the, the landmark legislation and right, right after the Voting Rights Act was passed, it was like a week when the Watts riots broke out, and LBJ was completely befuddled by this. Because uh, you know, he comes from a quid pro quo <laughs> world where you, you, you make the deal and you, uh, everybody's happy. And J. Edgar Hoover was firmly convinced that, uh, um, that the riots, as well as Dr. King and SCLC, were all plotted right out of Moscow. And uh, this was very serious and something that uh, uh, caused LBJ to give the go-ahead to some of Hoover's excesses uh, because he just couldn't uh, believe otherwise. And the uh, whole idea of, uh, well, the, um, um, the whole idea of King coming out as forcefully as he did against Johnson's war, and it was Johnson's war at that point, uh, puts Johnson on the defensive against the major civil rights <laughs> leader in the country. This was a very awkward position, to say the least. And uh, it was something that, that Johnson never forgave King for it, uh, and uh, it, it caused a lot of fuss at the time. Uh, remember, this is still 67, uh, and um, we, uh, the worst year of the war, 68, as far as casualties go, hadn't even happened yet. And then uh, I didn't get drafted until November of 69, for heaven's sake. And by then, everybody was sick of the war inside and outside. Uh, but um, we, we, we couldn't just walk away. <laughs> you know, I can't, 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 can't just drop it and declare victory and go home. And I, in, in the end, I remember uh, with a lot of other people who were saying, well, at least after this colossal blunder, and now we know even more about what a blunder it was, this recent Vietnam PBS series, if you haven't seen it, it it's excellent. Uh, my part of the war happened about episode nine, in case you're wondering. But anyway, the, the, uh, uh, it, it, it's coming out now how everybody, every administration, the Republican, Democrat, they all lied to us, uh, and one after another. Uh, and uh, uh, with the best of intentions, as they say. And I said, well, at least we're not gonna make that mistake again. <laughs> well, along comes Saddam Hussein. I'm sitting uh, arguing with uh, Laura Ingram <laughs> on MSNBC. <laughs> I'm the only actual veteran in the room, you know. <laughs> Everybody's talking about, we gotta go out there and show them how we can, you know, they, they can't tell us to do with this, whatever. Saddam Hussein can't do that to us, blah, blah, blah. Who were the voices that were the most anti-war at that time? Colin Powell and a bunch of other generals, all Vietnam era generals, you know. I mean, there was a, a, an understanding. Those who really knew the lessons of Vietnam knew better than to get involved in, in something like that. But we got involved in it anyway, and we're still trying to, trying to uh, resolve uh, uh, Iraq, Afghanistan, Syria, the awful, awful tragedy, et cetera. Uh, we're, we're not very good at this, you know, this is the thing. <laughs> you know, if we were smarter with our foreign policy, it wouldn't be so bad, but we make so many really bad mistakes. Uh, and uh, uh, then we get another, uh, get a president in who I don't really think knows where Afghanistan is <laughs> on a map, but that hasn't stopped us before. <laughs> uh, here we go again. Uh, so it's really, uh, no, I, I think Dr. King would, be, would definitely be uh, opposed to all this, and he's not alone. Uh, there are a lot of other pacifists out there on the street or, or people who are just anti-war or critical uh, of the war uh, on the right and the left, but we still have an amazing way of making these same mistakes over and over again. So. The struggle's just got to continue is all I can say. But thank you for your question, though. <laughs> see, uh, the, the, the woman right here, uh, in fact, I'll let you get your hand up. Nice. Or, or, well, m maybe not, uh, okay. Uh, okay. Okay, uh, oh, oh, we got two now, okay. <laughs> I'll let you decide. <laughs> oh, okay. Hi, um, this is a naive question I'm gonna start off with. 
are you feeling optimistic? And I'm going to back up and say that on November 9th, I was so depressed and made me sick. And, and I didn't think we'd ever make it out of this. But um, we, learned, we learned so much from, from the civil rights um, movement, and we rapidly mobilized. And um, you know, we saw the marches. And this last march, we were down with the kids, and it was so well organized, and they were recruiting and voting and passing out stickers. And they were so and well behaved. So well behaved, and everything. And articulate. It, it, went, it went amazingly well, but then we see so many of these movements that you're talking about, and we see um, a lot of, uh, you know, discussion and, and, and connectiveness with, um, with people opening up and trying to understand, and we're thinking about our history now, and we're looking at with the new African American History Museum, we're understanding our past better. So mm -hmm. I'm feeling optimistic. What about you? Yeah. <laughs> I have felt optimistic since the morning of the Women's March. And I uh, went <laughs> over there. A, f a friend of ours came in from Chicago, and uh, me and my, my wife and our friend all went down there together. And I, I mean, what the What's the, that the kids say, mind blown, you know. I mean, I've been to the, I've been, 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 been to about four inaugurations. I, uh, I was at the Million Man March. Uh, I was at the uh, uh, Million Man Sub March. <laughs> and uh, uh, I never saw a crowd like that. That was amazing. They, they, they just were spilling out of the woodwork literally every place. Uh, these pink hats everywhere. And it, it, it was one of the most amazing kind of uh, events because people came from all over the place. Uh, uh, it was not terribly well organized. It didn't have to be. It was like, well, this is, this is what, what I call a, a flash mob movement. Uh, I've been using that term ever since the, the uh, Tea Party uh, emerged uh, out of nowhere, largely connected by Twitter. Uh, and then the uh, Occupy movement popped up, same thing across the country. Uh, and I, I've seen this happen uh, repeatedly now with different movements. And now, uh, well, Black Lives Matter was another one. Uh, and now, uh, you know, the, the Women's March also, you have this massive expression of frustration and anger and concern. And you get something to digi dig digitally connect people. And it's amazing what they will do. Uh, and then the next question is, uh, how do you direct this energy uh, towards some kind of action. Well, when I look at the people now who weren't planning to run for office, but who are running for office now this year, when I look at what has happened with the special elections that, we, that we've seen, I've seen the kind of turnout. Uh, when I just, as, as a reporter, I remember four years ago when all the energy was on the right and there was apathy on the left, I, and part of it was just, oh, okay, Hillary again. Well, we, you know, well, we know the Clintons. They're reliable. They're predictable. They've been around since 92 and blah, blah, blah. And then, uh, what was it, somebody says, and then God said, ha, right, <laughs> whatever. Uh, you know, the, the predictions uh, uh, were tossed out. But what, what has happened then, since then? I tell you, uh, people I, I know personally who were apathetic, welded to their seats before, are out of their seats, and they're out doing petitions, they're out uh, signing people up, they're out uh, campaigning and, and, and working and fundraising, et cetera. Uh, uh, this has uh, uh, energized media in an uh, odd sort of way. Um, right when uh, the whole business model that we've used for 400 years is no longer that reliable, uh, it's called the, pip, the printing press for young people. Uh, there, uh, that that uh, all of a sudden now uh, we are getting a lot of activity now. People uh, who are connecting with uh, uh, blogging, uh, going online. Uh, this, this is something that wasn't happening before, but it's happening now. And uh, uh, even at the failing New York Times, as Donald Trump calls them, <laughs> circulation has never been better. <laughs> and I mean, but, but there's, there's a sense now. I mean, I'm, I'm on, uh, I sit on a couple of foundation boards. Well, you mentioned Committee to, Committee to Protect Journalists. I'm, I'm on a couple of boards also fund investigative projects. People are coming to us with money, throwing it over the transom to us. I mean, thank you, Meryl Streep. She helped a lot. Uh, they're on, on the Golden Globes, when she gave a plug to the committee to protect journalists. Uh, all of a sudden, we got all these uh, small donations that really add up. And uh, th 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 there's that kind of, kind of energy around the country now, uh, uh, because people are, are, are appreciating the press as an institution. 
I mean, they may hate us as individuals, but they appreciate the institution uh, because outside of the press, which, that's why Trump keeps going after the press so much. Uh, he's already got uh, both houses of Congress. Uh, he's got uh, all, all these judicial appointments. Uh, he thinks he's got the, the, the courts in his hip pocket. Uh, and uh, what's next? The press. Those, those mangy independent reporters out there, how dare they? Uh, so he, he calls up his buddies Erdogan and Duterte and Putin, and they all come right. Yeah, the rotten press. We got to get rid of them. We got a sense of mission now. It's, it's made a difference uh, for us. So, I, so th things like that uh, told me that you know we, we don't always need to be on high alert. Uh, there are sometimes we need to be on alert, especially when you got somebody who's hanging around that red button on the desk there. You got a bigger button? I got a bigger button. <laughs> So uh, I think that, uh, so uh, I mean, that's, that's why I'm not optim 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 optimistic. How about you? I, I'm still optimistic. Yeah. Good. All right. That's what I want to hear, ladies and gentlemen. I'm so low. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you wait now. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a real, it, it's a real shock. I, I don't care what political party you belong to. It, it's a shock to have your basic fundamental framework of belief suddenly knocked out from underneath <laughs> or your whole concept of reality, you know. Uh, and then uh, you also got somebody. Uh, now yelling at you, what do you mean? Of course my crowd size is bigger. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, this, this is the kind of age we're in now. So I think the pursuit of truth and facts has uh, never been more important, as far as I'm concerned. But thank you very much. <laughs> yes, sir. We just want to get it on the, yeah. it's called the TV. That's why we, we do this. I forgot about TV here, haven't I? I? I've kept it pretty clean, though, haven't I? <laughs> For the most part. Uh, I agree with your analysis of the effect of the timing of Dr. King's assassination on his legacy. Mm -hmm. And I've often wondered how successful he might have been moving the needle uh, in, in poverty, in class issues that he was, he was turning his attention to. Good question. Yeah, so I'm gonna ask you to speculate. If he had not been assassinated, what would the effect have been would we be any different? Would he have been successful? What thoughts do you have on that? Yeah, I'm a, I'm, I'm a little depressed when I think about that because it's like uh, not just King, but, but, but JFK. Would the Civil Rights Act of 64 have passed if JFK had been pushed against that of LBJ? Uh, any of you who are familiar with how hard that was to get passed? You know, it took a genius of uh, 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 up there on Capitol Hill to shepherd that through. And I would I wouldn't want to be in a position of trading lives, you know. If you could have saved JFK, but it would have cost you the Civil Rights Act. You know, uh, history's like that. And the same kind of thing with, with Dr. King. There was a, uh, um, uh, that after he was assassinated, there, there was a, this wave of, uh, of uh, sympathy suddenly uh, that uh, recognized him as being a heroic figure and also folks wanted to, you know, lash back at this awful man who had taken him from us. And uh, it was similar to the kind of, uh, well, look at how much more liberal we were as Americans in the early 60s. <laughs> you know, uh, we first, the, the war on poverty really kind of started with, with, with Michael Harrington and the, and the uh, uh, at the time, uh, people looking at poor whites in Appalachia. And then LBJ went out there and lots of war on poverty and uh, the TV cameras followed him and suddenly the, the face of poverty uh, became white and uh, got a lo lot of attention. And then only a couple of years later, the Watts riots break out, and we, the face of poverty becomes black, uh, where it's pretty much stayed since then. Uh, so much so that um, I dare say most Americans probably believe that, that uh, uh, poor blacks outnumber poor whites, and they, uh, we don't. <laughs> they don't. I can't call myself Poe anymore. My daddy always said we were so poor we couldn't afford the O and the R. We just Poe. But anyway. <laughs> uh, but the, um, uh, 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 there is a, um, a, a um, uh, sense now with, uh, um, with the war on poverty at that time, right after JFK's assassination, LBJ, a master legislator and, 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 and shirt puller, <laughs> whatever, uh, he got more legislation passed. He initiated more successful legislation than any other president in American history. Uh, were it not for that black mark, that ink blot of Vietnam, to to kind of describe a, con a famous Pulitzer Prize winning Conrad cartoon, you know, of Johnson's legacy, and there was that one black spot of Vietnam right in the middle. If it weren't for that, we would be marveling at all, at all he could pull off. Uh, could he could he have pulled off Medicare nowadays? Look at how much trouble Obamacare had. 
but, but look, at how he also had, he had a Democratic Congress. Uh, there was all kinds of uh, uh, things were happening at the time. The, the, the attitude uh, nationally was different. Also, I, th I think Southern, Southern black segregationists were kind of marginalized during that period. Uh, later on, as um, uh, the, the hard hats rose up and you, a white backlash became uh, more uh, in fashion, uh, you saw more opposition uh, coming from the right. But by then, you had all, all this uh, progressive legislation had been passed. Even Nixon passed the Clean Air Act, for heaven's sake, the uh, Clean Air and Water Act. Of course, we know that Nixon also didn't really care that much about domestic policy. He had a Democratic Congress. He really cared a lot about world international relations. So it, it was kind of a deal. He, uh, uh, you know, he, let me have what I want internationally, and I'll let you have what you want domestically. So you, you had a, a level of comity uh, there that has not been seen in Washington in quite some time. Uh, but uh, uh, Nixon was able to open the doors to China and, and that sort of thing. So it, it, was, it was a very uh, different era in a lot of ways. Uh, nowadays, we have a, 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 an era of, of super gridlock, uh, which is unfortunate now because uh, uh, you don't have people on both sides coming together out of uh, a shared interest. Uh, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, couldn't have passed without Republican votes. Uh, I was always grateful to Everett Dirksen for that. Uh, so, who I never, I never met him. I, I worked with his granddaughter. Uh, and uh, I'll never forget David Brinkley uh, describing Everett Dirksen's voice as uh, resembling a chorus of corduroy pants, <laughs> which is one, one, of the, one of the best metaphors I've <laughs> heard anywhere. But in, in the spirit of Abe Lincoln, his fellow Illinoisan, uh, Dirksen uh, shepherded the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act through. And uh, uh, this, uh, I mean, it wasn't all, uh, all uh, honey and uh, roses. Uh, it was hardball politics, but, but they, they got stuff done. And uh, we don't have that now. Uh, and when we're going to get back to that, I don't know. Because uh, uh, we become more and more tribal, which I didn't even get into. I know you all want to get out of here before Saturday. Uh, but uh, our politics are, are more tribalized now. And uh, uh, so uh, it's, it's enough, at a time when information is more freely available than ever before, people are rejecting it more and just simply saying, uh, well, I'm a Democrat. Therefore, I believe so and so. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> you know? Uh, or your kids can't play with my kids, or whatever. Uh, that's when things start getting tribalized, and that's where our politics are now. Uh, so uh, I'm waiting to see what happens after the midterms now. <laughs> Since I've gotten out of the predictions game, I'm just <laughs> I'm watching to see if we're going to become less tribalized or more after this year. We'll see. Well, uh, uh, Mr. Page, I think we take one more question and. Um, and then perhaps folks can continue conversation out in the hallway. But we've That's got fine. One, one I'll, I'll try, I'll try to be brief. Which, uh, well, well, we've enjoyed actually. hearing your, your remarks and whatever, whatever it is, it is. <laughs> Thank you. I'm yes. thinking of your, your lecture as the drum major for justice and all the things you said about Dr. King. The, where are we going? Where, what do we do now? Where are we going from here? Opportunity gap the unfulfilled dreams. And I wonder if you have anything to tell us. And when you look around this room, would you say there is unfulfilled dreams? Are those who are marginalized? Does it reflect opportunity gap? Why are they not here? How do we engage them? That's what I'd like to hear from you. How do we engage those who are not here? Because as I look around, it seems like there's an opportunity gap here. And I'd like to make a difference. I am dissatisfied, as Dr. King says, and I would like to make a difference. I would like right that on. to be changed. So I'd like to hear your words of wisdom on this. Yeah, thank you. That's a very, very good question. And, and I, you know, uh, look, look around the room, uh, are, are, are the marginalized people here? Um, I, I can't read minds, but I would guess not because people aren't that pissed off right now. <laughs> and and I, I say it quite frankly, uh, emotions are one of the most important motivating forces in politics. And you could go, in, in Ferguson, Missouri, you could go to a, a town hall meeting and you wouldn't see any black folks there until after the uh, Michael Brown uh, killing. And then all of a sudden people got energized. Uh, just like the women, women who came out uh, to the women's march there after Donald Trump's election, people got energized. You know, folks will uh, think that it, it's actually kind of a kind of a good sign for local leaders when there's lots of apathy, because it, it indicates either people are satisfied or they're just they feel powerless, one way or the other. And if they feel powerless, that's that's not good. People should feel like they have a have a stake in the game, 
and, and that they can affect change of some sort. It's positive. But first of all, you've got to look, look at what, what kind of change do you want. And we can, I mean, as a uh, resident here who's uh, raised a son here, I know there's uh, things this community can do to improve just like any other community. Uh, certain things will rise to a level of concern that causes people to come out in groups and say, we need to do something about this. Uh, other times, it's not that big of a concern, but uh, the, the tide can rise and fall. But I, I would say that, first of all, your activism is, is good. I encourage everybody to be involved. Otherwise, you're going to be uh, sitting back. What was it? What, another line about, um, there's a, uh, yeah, my, my father used to say that there's two kinds of people in this world, son. There's the movers and shakers and those who get moved and shaken. <laughs> Never forget that. It's basically true. You, know, you, you either have, have a stake in the changes that are going on around you or you're just being buffeted around. And uh, that's, that's a very frustrating situation when you are being buffeted around and you're not able to uh, implement uh, change on your own. But what's the first step? It's, it's to organize, get together with like-minded folks, and work on getting the system to respond. And, and, and that's a, a big challenge in a lot of ways because uh, I think about the civil rights movement. It was one thing to tell people like the old spiritual uh, like Moses and the old spiritual, let my people go. That's a simple act. Just, just, just let them go. Let them be free. But how about let my people have better schools? Uh, let my people have more jobs. Uh, can you bring back the steel mills that we lost in our community or whatever? You know, Those are more complicated questions. And so it requires more than just organizing. It also requires a more concerted effort uh, and a plan of some sort. Uh, was a Walter Fontroy used to say, uh, plan your work, then work your plan. <laughs> and that's what it takes, though. Uh, and it's, uh, so I, I think um, before I get too maudlin, uh, it's important uh, to be involved. And that's why I love to see people coming out on a, a nice night like this to be involved in what's happening here in the community. And I thank you all for the honor of sharing this evening with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> I got back to my water cup. <laughs> 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 <laughs>